Hello, Delaware. Welcome to another edition of We All Go to Washington. I'm your host, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, Delaware's at-large member in the U.S. Congress. Last month, I was joined by civil rights icon, Congressman John Lewis, for a discussion on the importance of voting. And between now and Election Day, you can catch me here on Channel 28 on the fourth Sunday of every month at 9 p.m. and on YouTube. In this episode, I'll be joined by an incredible panel of guests for a conversation about how you can get involved in elections at the federal, state, and local levels of government. Before I introduce my guest, I want to take a moment to highlight a few of the legislative initiatives I'm working on in Congress. Just this week, I introduced a first-of-its-kind criminal justice reform bill called Clean Slate, which provides reformed federal nonviolent offenders the opportunity for a second chance in life. My bill would automatically seal their records so that a minor drug offense is not a hurdle to getting a job, buying a home, or going to college. This bipartisan legislation passed and was signed into law in Pennsylvania a few weeks ago, and now we are working on it at the federal level. On our last show, we talked briefly about how to transform a moment into a movement, and that's why I'm also pleased to introduce the Empower Act, which will build on the work of the hashtag MeToo movement by cracking down on sexual harassment in the workplace. We've got an exciting show for you and a lot of ground to cover, so stay tuned until the end of the program for an important update on voting deadlines. I'm Lisa Blunt Rochester, and I'm running for re-election for Congress here in Delaware. And we hope that you will continue to be on this journey with us because there's still so much more work to be done. Welcome back. Joining me is Megan Wallace, the co-founder of Mary Ann's List, Bethony Wambu Kroll, the Vice President of National Outreach and Training for EMILY's List, and Eric Schramm, the Delaware Democratic Party Chair. They're here today to tell you about their organizations and how you can get involved. So when I first threw my hat into the ring to run for Congress, I really didn't have an idea of the different resources that were available to me or even how to hire campaign folks. So this is why I really wanted this section um, to be a part of the show because people really don't know, you know, how, what are the jobs and how to get involved, or what are the resources that are available to them? So we've got a great panel, and I'm going to jump right into the questions, all right? Okay, so inquiring minds want to know, what made each of you get into politics in the first place? So we'll, we'll, start, we'll start with you, Megan. Great. Um, so uh, I think for, as you said, politics can be intimidating. Um, so I think for a lot of women, we come to the work um, through something personal. So the personal is political, that kind of feminist uh, mantra. Um, so personally, I got involved because I was an advocate for domestic violence and survivors of sexual assault. Um, so that's really where I found my passion for politics, doing the legislative work around those issues. Really? Did you come in as a legislative aide or how? Yeah, did you so, start as a volunteer? Or? Yep. So I, a friend from college who I had worked on um, uh, some student advocacy work with in those areas had invited me to apply for a job as a legislative aide. And so I kind of oh. took the chance and did so. And that's where I got my foot in the door. Excellent, excellent. And how about you, Eric? Um, I actually did a year of AmeriCorps VISTA. Um, and okay. after my first year, I really found it interesting kind of working at the grassroots level, serving um, folks that didn't have the best opportunities in life. So moved to Delaware, did a second year of AmeriCorps VISTA, and, and met a lot of politicians for my first time. And joined my first campaign and realized that, you know, why I went to school to be a teacher, um, that kind of the organizational side of campaign management, getting a message out and really helping people. Um, so I, I dove into campaign work and politics that way. Excellent, excellent. And Mathoni? Well, I would say it has something probably to do with the subtle fact that I could hold protest signs before I could walk. Okay. Uh, I think you may be familiar yes. with this sort of parental osmosis yes, that happens. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but I'm the daughter of two really active educators who yeah. believe that to whom much is given, much also is required. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I, I actually got involved, though, in the way that I'm involved in my organization, Emily's List, because understanding, and I know we're going to go right into these yeah. resources about 
how many people really don't know the resources that are involved just to win one little congressional seat? And right. I know it's not little, but right. really, when you think about how many seats there are in this country right. and the amount of resources it takes to win those, it's right. incredible. Right. Um, and so my first job in politics really taught me how many people had a political education gap around campaigns mm -hmm. and how they work. You know, it's interesting as I sit here and listen to each of you, I, I've, I've been with these folks for years now and have watched their dedication and passion for multiple issues and for multiple candidates. And so this is really special to actually have this conversation because we're talking about on a local level and also on a national level. And I really wanted to share with folks, you know, a little bit about what your organizations do. I mean, first of all, Mary Ann's List is new. Mm -hmm. Emily's List has been around, but a lot of people don't even realize that Emily is not even a person. It's, you can tell them what it stands for. <laughs> yeah. And then our Democratic Party, a lot of folks don't know how they can get involved and what the party is there for as well. So let's, let's, let's start off uh, with Mathoni talking about Emily's List, and then we'll go to Mary Ann's List, and then the party. Well, look, I think we were never more aware of the fact that there were a lot of folks who after the 2016 election wanted to figure out how to get more engaged politically mm -hmm. and that we needed to do more to make ourselves a lot more visible and to up the resources, frankly, that we were able to provide to women across this country. Um, we are now at over 40,000 women who have reached out to Emily's List saying, I may be interested in running for office. But th they're also saying, I'm not sure. Like, I, I, I want to do something. I know I want to do something. Help me figure out what that is. And another 8,000 who have said, well, I know that I absolutely want to help a woman run. Mm -hmm. So with that, we have built out a ton of resources that I won't go into right now, but go to emilyslist.org join our run to win list and yeah. there's so much to be gained by that including joining our Facebook community right. of over 5,000 lit women <laughs> they are lit, they are lit. Yeah. well a lot of people don't know that Emily stands for early, early money, money is, is like, like yeast. yeast it makes the dough rise it does. and it's one of those things that yeah. we need to be able to compete is to be able to have those resources and so I'm going to turn it to you Megan to talk a little bit about Mary Ann's list and where that came from sure so Mary Ann's List is an organization, uh, much like Emily's List, where we work to elect pro-choice Democratic women. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually started kind of out of um, uh, a debate among some of my colleagues and I around how we really needed a woman to run for an open congressional seat in Delaware. And at the time, we had heard that Emily's List was in our state trying to find women to run for that seat. Um, and this was before Lisa's name right. was out there. Um, and we were really fr uh, frustrated with the idea that we had had two men kind of throw their hat in the ring at that point and, and just frustrated with the idea that how is it possible in, in, in across our state that there's no women leaders that could step in uh, and run here. Um, and of course, Emily's List came in and, and helped right. recruit Lisa. Yeah. Um, and here we are. Yes. Um, but we know that there's a pipeline of candidates that need to be ready to fill seats Absolutely. like that. Um, so we really see a place for a local organization Mm -hmm. um, to, to kind of step in there. And just share who Mary Ann, tell about the Mary Ann. Yeah, so we're named after two Mary Ann's, uh, Mary Ann Shad Carey from Wilmington and Mary Ann Sword and Stewart from Sussex County. Um, and these two women were suffragettes. Um, they both died before um, they ever saw women have the right to vote. And we wanted um, a north and a, so uh, a northern and a southern woman and, and also um, Mary Ann Shad Carey is a very prominent African American woman. Um, and so we really felt like they, they embodied kind of the values of our organization. Right, right. Um, and so those two Marianne's are who, we, who we've named ourselves for. Excellent, yeah. excellent. And now I'm going to turn it over to Eric to talk about the Delaware Democratic Party and share with, with folks who we are, what resources are provided. Absolutely. Um, you know, the Delaware Democratic Party is in existence to, to get Democrats elected. Um, what I've definitely changed in terms of since I became chair is just making it more open, transparent, um, mm -hmm. diversity, making sure we have a, a depth of candidates that really show all walks of life in Delaware. Um, you know, we provide all sorts of resources from campaign trainings to the voter file. Um, but I think, you know, most importantly, we have to do a better job, and we're starting to get there in terms of putting out our democratic message. Right. Like what really lights people on fire, what makes people want to come to the party um, and get involved, and really reminding people that it is their party. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a good old boy party. It's right. not a party with a back room where people decide. Um, and I've really tried to change that kind of um, perception right. of our party in Delaware. Right. And, and 
you know, for people that want to get more involved, obviously www.deldems.org. Lots of opportunities. Say that again. www.deldems.org. Excellent. I, we, we really do have limited time, but I did want to ask one last question, and it really is about 2018. And what is at stake? Why do people need to vote? Why do people need to be engaged? And in, in, in a few seconds, if you could each just give what you think are the reasons that this is an important, important election, these midterms. And mm -hmm. I'll start with you, sure. Megan. So first of all, I think everything's at stake. So I think that um, everything, especially at the local level, it, at the state legislative level, we have all kinds of policy decisions made from criminal justice reform to education, you name it. And so we really need to have women at the table helping make policy decisions about our own lives. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just say, look, we're at a point where we're deciding what kind of country we want to be. And we need everybody's voice as we make this critical decision going forward. Excellent. And Eric? The immediate thing that pops into mind is the Supreme Court, but back to the local level, we need to make sure we have you know quality Democrats elected at all levels right. to really protect laws at the local level um, and, and kind of this period where we're at risk with what's happening now. Well, I want to thank my guests for joining me, and I want to encourage each of you to get involved, whether it's through Emily's List or Mary Ann's List, the Democratic Party, and there are a whole host of other organizations as well. But you have a place at the table, and we want you to join. Thanks to so many of you, we made history in 2016. I became Delaware's first woman and first person of color to represent us in Congress. It was an incredible evening, and I remember a lot of people asking me, what does it feel like to make history? I really didn't think about it. We were just doing the work. But then on the day that I was sworn in, that I stood on that house floor and raised my hand to take the oath, I carried with me a scarf that my sister created that was uh, an oath that allowed our great-great-great-grandfather to have the right to vote. And at that moment, it really hit me that we are here because we're standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. I've spent my entire career working to ensure that all Delawareans have the opportunities they deserve. And that didn't stop when I went to Congress. Lisa has been working hard to help the businesses up and down the state find the capital they need to help them succeed in Delaware. She believes in engaging people of all ages and all backgrounds in the democratic process and she's working to ensure all voices are heard. She listens to the young people of today and empowers them to be leaders of tomorrow. She understands that in order to be successful, we need a safe learning environment. She recognizes that the keys to enriching our children's futures and unleashing their innovative and creative spirit are a quality education and the arts. She believes that love is love. And that discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity has no place in our society. She knows that if we're going to leave the world a better place for our daughters, we have much more work to do to ensure that they have equal opportunity so that they can reach their full potential. I'm running for re-election because there is still more work to be done, more for us to accomplish to truly leave our mark on history. This year, every voice must be heard. So I'm asking for your vote and your participation in our journey to re-election. And remember, when Lisa goes to Washington, we all go. We, we all go. go. We, we all go. go. We all go. We all go. We all go to Washington. I'm Lisa Blunt Rochester, and I approve this message. Tonight, we have a very special guest, a dear friend and a colleague of mine representing New Mexico's third congressional district. He's a proud native son of his home state, and he's also chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, known to many as the DCCC. We're joined here by Congressman Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us, and say hi to Delaware. Well, it's always an honor to be with you, Representative. Um, you know, the leadership that Lisa brings to the Congress, to the American people. Uh, we just uh, have learned to appreciate her so very much. We count on her and we believe in her. I know as so many of you do as well. But hello, Delaware. Um, it's an honor to be with all of you. My name is Ben Ray Lujan, as I was introduced by Lisa, uh, from the great state of New Mexico, um, from a small little town about 20 miles north of our capital city of Santa Fe. And I grew up on a small little farm out there, um, fourth generation where I live today. 
uh, but grew up uh, attending to that little farm and uh, doing everything from getting up early in the morning in the winter, making sure those stock tanks were uh, cracked open so that the animals could get to that important uh, drink of water during the day, um, but all the hard work that comes with it. So uh, always an honor to be here, but especially to say hello uh, to all of our friends and uh, all of the supporters and voters and constituents uh, that Lisa Blunt Rochester represents and fights for day in and day out. Ooh, I, I'm so pleased to have you here. And for those of you who don't know Ben Ray, um, he, you know, sometimes people talk in Washington a lot about shining stars and rising stars and all of that. He is a true star and he is truly a person who believes in our democratic ideals. He is a person who believes in supporting candidates and making sure that we actually get to 218 in 2018. And so what I wanted to um, have you share a little bit about is just tell people how you got involved in politics and public service, um, because part of this show is focused on making sure that people who are interested in running know about running, people who are interested in working on campaigns know about campaigns, but most importantly that everybody play their part and get involved and vote. So if you could just share a little bit about your background in terms of you know getting involved, engaged in public service, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's at stake for the voters this year. Well, Lisa, I was really influenced and inspired by my parents. Gotcha. Uh, my mother, who retired after 33 years from the local public school district, a little school by the name of Pawakit. Don't try and spell it, <laughs> but you can come visit it. Okay. Um, so you come on out, and it's a, a great little community. And my father, um, he was an iron worker. My, my father um, learned how to weld um, out in the shipyards of San Pedro, California, um, came back to New Mexico, uh, where um, he was able to marry his high school sweetheart, my mom, Carmen. I worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, working to build uh, the facilities up there as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and while my father was up there, um, he, uh, you know, he would talk to his brothers and sisters in labor and talk about one challenge or another going on in the community. And they would tell him, Ben, so I share my father's name, okay. Ben, you know, we're tired of you talking about this. Why don't you do something about it? Yeah. And so my father said, well, I'll do that then, but I'm going to need your help. And so he ran for county commissioner in the small community that we live in and uh, worked hard, knocked on some doors, pounded the pavement and didn't win. Wow. So his friends and family, they realized how serious he was about this. Yeah. And he kept working. Yeah. Two years later, he ran for that same seat because he believed that public service was a way to make a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. That you could, you could advocate for those that didn't have a voice and be that strong voice. Right. And he won. Wow. Served on the county commission, soon found himself elected by his colleagues as the chair of that commission. And my father, who was a blue collar guy, right? He yeah. grew up well and getting those hands dirty, getting up early in the morning. Um, sometimes when he'd get up for his shift and he'd try to fire up that old Chevy he had, it'd start, sometimes it wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't keep him from getting to work. He'd walk up the road wow. uh, when that truck didn't start. And I'll be darned if you know someone he worked with didn't pick him up, yeah. get him to work and bring him back at the end of the day. And then we'd get together, we'd try to fix that old Chevy, right. Right. get it uh, fired up for the next day. But, so my father served in the county commission and then soon found himself serving in the state house, wow. the state legislature. He served as a whip, he served as leader and served as speaker of the house in the state of New Mexico. And all along it was his partnership with my mom, the, the importance mm -hmm. of getting involved, staying involved, mm -hmm. compassion, fighting, speaking up, right. um, that really influenced me. Now, right. I was the youngest of four okay. by eight years. Wow. And so, you know, uh, I say that I I'm, I'm, was the accident that <laughs> kept my mom and dad young. <laughs> okay. And so my siblings, they, they didn't want me around, uh -huh. right? They were like, oh, he's too young. We don't uh -huh. have to babysit him. I never appreciated the education of being present and learning right. because I'd always be with mom and dad right. at right. campaign events, at rallies, right. in hearings in different meetings, sitting in the governor's office, visiting with advocates, whatever it may be, I was there at my father's yeah. and my mother's feet, listening and learning. And it was that appreciation um, that really inspired me and got me involved, okay. Lisa. I saw my father, he'd make a difference every day. Yeah. He had an open door policy. And even while he was serving as speaker of the house, mm -hmm. if people would come visit him and mom or us on, on the weekend, right. knock on that door, you pour them a cup of coffee, right. welcome them in, yeah. and hear them out. Yeah. Try to make a difference. And so it, it really was watching you know, people yeah. that I was fortunate to be raised by right. Right. that instilled in me the importance of that 
hard work and getting things done, you know, that we really we have can make that a difference. in common. We, yeah. we have that in common. My, my father actually served in public service as oh. well, both in the education system, but also in, in uh, elected office as a city council person. And mm. then he became city council president in Wilmington. Many of you know Ted Blunt. Oh. And, you know, I think you're right that, that being there and being a part of knocking on doors, uh, listening when constituents called with problems, uh, it, it creates that sense of, of of knowing that we're in it together and that we have a responsibility. And just like your dad, my dad ran and didn't win the first time. So lesson to everybody, don't give up just because you might not win the first time. That's right. Because even the fruits of that labor might end up in Congress. Who knows? Yeah. You know, so. And even in that defeat, you can still make a yes. difference. Yes. I mean, you, you know, you're raising issues and questions and bringing right. attention to issues that deserve attention right. to all those injustices right. that sometimes people turn a blind eye to. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, speaking of injustices or turning a blind eye, let's turn an eye to the fall of 2018 and what's at stake and oh. why do people need to be engaged? Why do people need to vote? Look, there's so much at stake. Yeah. and. Uh, look, in the community that I was born and raised in, mm -hmm. um, similar, Lisa, to communities all across America, it's, it, it's small, it's rural, everyone knows one another. Um, you know, you, you, you get to know the same uh, family and friends and neighbors when you're going to the ball game or the grocery store, or you're going to church, wherever it may be. And it's that community yeah. um, that you get to know. Right. But you also get to know people well, especially when they're confiding in you. Mm -hmm. And so many families across the country are still facing immense challenges, working two and three jobs, middle-class families that are still struggling to pay the rent or pay the mortgage to keep that roof over their head, maybe save a little bit right. so that way they can put it into some savings or maybe even just go out and go camping or get yeah. to the ball game or whatever it may be on the weekend. Right. So many people across the, the country are still going through tough times. And I think that's what my colleagues, my Republican yeah. colleagues are just blind to. Um, the notion that our Republican colleagues would pass a tax scam, a bill, a piece of legislation where our Republican House colleagues promised to prioritize middle class families. And I'll be darned if the package rewarded corporations and the most wealthy with 83% of that benefit. The split was off. Yeah, yeah. You, middle class families that were promised that they were going to get more support and be the primary focus of the bill, they were lied to. And that's not right. right. They should have been prioritized. But along the way, the Republicans in that piece of legislation actually did something that's increasing the cost of health care and the American people. That's the issue. Uh, look, I hear whether about you're in Delaware or you're in healthcare. New Mexico, mm -hmm. you see the cost of those premiums going up, those deductibles going up, out of pocket costs going up. Right. And look, my father, he sadly passed with about with stage four lung cancer. People with pre existing conditions. Our Republican colleagues' piece of legislation actually was going to turn their backs on them. And then we now saw that under this administration, they actually did turn their backs on people with pre-existing conditions. People like my dad would have been left out. Right. And we all share stories like that. Right. So we say, what's at stake? Yeah. See the dignity and the respect right. and the treatment of hardworking middle-class families across America. Right. That's what we need to be focusing on. And in my opinion, that's what's at stake right now, yeah. is making sure that they're put first, that we have an agenda that's for the people, of the people, and by the people, mm -hmm. and that we're driving that agenda home. Yeah. And that same story that I told you about my father, it's also about the working conditions that people find themselves in. Mm -hmm. What we didn't know is every day that my dad was going to work, yeah. he was getting a little more sick every day. He wasn't a smoker, but he died because of a, a bout with stage four lung cancer. and. He didn't need to. Mm -hmm. If there would have been safer working conditions in place for those people that get up for that morning shift or that graveyard shift, mm -hmm. that are putting in that hard day's work, that come home dusty to be able to be with their family and their kids, keep that roof over their head, they deserve to be protected and they deserve better. Yeah. And it's just not right. And there's pieces of legislation every day right. that are actually putting workers in harm's way. Yeah. So it's personal for me. I know it's personal for right. you and people across Delaware and back in right. New Mexico. That's what's at stake. And so I just say, look, everything that we can do to put people first, to fight for our democracy, to make sure that we're uh, making things better, um, yeah. I think that's what's at stake. And whatever that drives you personally, yeah. focus all that energy. If you marched back in February or January 2017 mm -hmm. with the Women's March, mm -hmm. if you're a student 
or someone across America that's driven by the March for Our Lives. Right. If you were so concerned with what we saw Republicans in this administration doing with the assault on climate issues and climate change and global warming and the assault on science and you got involved with the March of Science, whatever that may be. Yeah. If you've been able to bring that voice forward yeah. with the courage of being a victim of domestic violence or sexual harassment mm -hmm. and the Me Too movement has freed so many people in the country to speak yeah. up. Whatever it may be, we need people voting and we need them right. to be active. So it's all at stake yeah. and we can be better. Now, I don't want to yeah. end that on a low note. Right. I'm inspired about what can be done and me you too. inspire me every day, Lisa, with the way you, you speak to us and you, you, you channel into the greater good of what we can get done here. Yeah. And I think that's what we're also yeah. looking to do across the country is yeah. make sure that we're inspiring one another and that we remind one another right. um, why it's important to get involved and vote that's and right. that we lend that helping hand exactly. wherever we can. Exactly. You know, we're supposed to love thy neighbor. Exactly, exactly. And we do more when we get that done. Uh, I, I totally yeah. agree. And I wanted the audience to hear hear from you because you are on the road all across the country trying to make sure that we elect great people to Congress and that's really what's at stake. I mean, it all of these issues that Ben Ray just talked about are at stake and even the most recent issue you talked about, the, the Me Too movement, just today I was able to, uh, with uh, some of my colleagues both on the Republican and Democratic side, Senate and House, introduce a, a bill called the Empower Act mm. to deal with the whole focus of making sure there's a tip line for people who are being harassed, making sure that there are not these non-disclosure clauses in, in, in contracts, and really just to prevent that kind of discrimination. And those are the kind of important things that are on the line for us, as Ben Ray mentioned, healthcare. And I, as many of you know, um, I'm the kind of person who says, you know, a reporter asked me, Lisa, are you frustrated being in Congress? And I said, I'm not frustrated, I'm motivated. Mm -hmm. That's what we want people to be. We want you to be motivated and activated so that when the fall comes, we're ready to make the changes that need to be made. So I just thank you so much for your leadership across the country. I thank you for your friendship and he's a mentor. And uh, we just, we, we're just really blessed to have you as a part of our team. So thank um, you, Ben Ray, thank Mr. You, Lisa. Chairman. No, and thanks to everyone out in Delaware. Thanks for uh, being supportive of Lisa Blunt Rochester. Um, I look forward to seeing you in person someday, um, getting a chance to chat a little bit. So if you see me at a coffee shop or a grocery store, just walking down the street, please stop me and say hello. Um, if, or if you find yourselves out in New Mexico, uh, please look us up. Uh, let's get this done and please get involved, stay active and let's vote. Let's vote. Ladies and gentlemen, we're almost out of time. We have so much more to talk about in the next few months. So I hope you'll continue to join me. Don't forget to join me every fourth Sunday through the fall at 9 p.m. and on YouTube. Because when Lisa goes to Washington, we all go to Washington. I'm Lisa Blunt Rochester, and I approve this message.